This event has been organized as a response to some of the beautiful themes in our current exhibition, Laura Toller, Three Songs, curated by Heather Anderson. Laura is a Romanian-born, Ottawa-based artist, filmmaker, and choreographer, and Three Songs comprises of three videos that explore such themes as familial ties, loss, displacement, and experiences of duality, of being caught between places that are familiar to those creating new lives in different countries. So we're really grateful to have the support of Migration and Diaspora Studies at Carleton University for this exhibition. And I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Malini Guha, who's an associate in Migration and Diaspora Studies, as well as in Film Studies. And together, we invited our three esteemed panelists, Natasha Bakht, Orly Lael Netzer and Masha Salvatina to have a conversation um, uh, that will bring their own research and experience into conversation with three songs. So I'm just going to share my screen again. So there is live captioning for this event. So to turn on the live captioning, you can click the up icon of the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. You're welcome to leave your camera on. So you will be muted and uh, I will be spotlighting Malini and the panelists. Please use the chat function uh, to contribute to the conversation and we'll have some time at the end to field questions from you. And the event will be about 90 minutes long. And remember to move and take a break from the screen, have a glass of water um, as you need it. Thank you to the Stonecroft Foundation for the Arts, which promotes education in the visual arts and fosters the public's appreciation of the visual arts. Thank you as well to Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, and Carleton University. So I'll introduce uh, Malini, who will then introduce the panelists. So uh, Malini Guha is an Associate Professor of Film Studies at Carleton University. Her research interests are expansive extending from a long-standing commitment to thinking and writing about film and the city, as well as diasporic and post-colonial cinemas. Her essays have been published in Feminist Media Histories, the Canadian Journal of Film Studies, uh, Screening the Past, and the Journal of British Cinema and uh, Television. So I'll hand it over to you, Melina. Thank you so much, Fiona. I'm really thrilled to moderate this discussion on Laura Toller's wonderful exhibition, Three Songs. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to spend time with these works and alongside Fiona to come up with a group of panelists who could speak to the different facets of this exhibition, one that involves multiple forms of translation, um, as well as musical and movement vocabularies that the artist draws upon in her exploration of one of the most significant dilemmas of migration, of being split in two. But also, I would say that these works get us to consider other kinds of possibilities that arise precisely from these feelings of estrangement and dissonance. And so here we are with my idea of a dream panel. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being here with us today. We are grateful for your presence and for your energy. So now I'm going to introduce each of our speakers to you. Natasha Buck is a professor of law at the University of Ottawa and the Shirley Greenberg Chair for Women and the Legal Profession. Pat is also an Indian contemporary dancer and choreographer who trained in Parthnatyam under Governor General Performing Arts Medalist Menika Tucker for over 20 years. She is currently artist in residence at Ottawa Dance Directive. Orly Leal Netzer is an instructor at Carleton University School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies. She studies cultural forms of testimony in contemporary Canada, asking how relations within the nation state are shaped by practices of reading as acts of witnessing. She recently co-edited Trans Narratives, Trans, Transmedia, Transnational with Anna Horvat, Sarah McRae, and Julie Back, and this is a Rutledge publication that came out in 2021. Masha Salaskina is a professor at the Mel Hoppenheim School of Cinema at Concordia University. Her work incorporates transnational approaches to film theory and cultural history, 
and her current research projects center on the shared cinematic cultures of global socialism in the 20th century and the reception of popular media from the global south in the socialist bloc in the 1970s and 1980s. So these are our illustrious speakers. Before we get started, I just wanted to give everyone a sense of how we structured this event. So I circulated uh, three questions to our speakers in advance that we will draw upon to structure the first part of the discussion. And then we will devote the remaining time to answering questions from you, our audience. So as Fiona has already said, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and we will spend time trying to answer them in the final part of the discussion. So let's begin with my, my first question to our speakers. Um, I would like to now invite each of you to talk about your specific entry points to this exhibition. How does Three Songs speak to your existing practice and scholarship? So I was thinking we could begin with Nash, uh, Natasha and then move to Orly and then Masha. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, let me start by just saying how enthralled I was by the exhibit. Um, I found myself really absorbed by all aspects of it. Uh, the films, the voices, I really felt everything really drew me into this incredibly rich and beautiful history and set of stories. Um, my points of entry to Laura Toller's wonderful ex exhibition are that I too am an artist and I share a movement or dance background with her. I am like her, an immigrant from a minority community and a woman. My academic work is in law and involves the exploration and treatment of minority religious communities who are often products of migration. My research and writing, what I try to do in my research and writing is give voice to minoritized individuals and communities who face oppression, but who nonetheless find beautiful ways to resist and thrive. And I have to say that I'm particularly interested in the stories of women. So in fact, I was quite surprised by the many ways in which um, Laura Toller's exhibition spoke to my scholarship and practice. Um, and I was struck in particular um, in song number two, by the focus given to the everyday work that women do. So the ordinary work of folding textiles, pouring water, cleaning up, um, the many tasks, some of which are unseen, but presumed of living on a farm. This is women's work. Um, it's often unseen, unpaid, and undervalued. And it's also work that is it's steeped in culture. So the cloth that is folded, for example, its design carries so much cultural information and significance. Um, and in song number two, I felt that Toller's deliberate, careful, and thoughtful folding of the cloth uh, really demonstrated respect and value of women's work. And in carrying out these you know, mundane tasks in her grandmother's home, Amidst moments of thoughtfulness, while family and neighbors observed, I felt that Toller really insisted that as observers, we too respect this often unseen but critical place where, where culture thrives. Um, women are often the carriers of culture, whether we want to be or not. Um, and so through their cooking, their cleaning, passing down of dances and stories to children, I think women carry this cultural burden. Um, and I found that Toller's removal of her wig, in addition to its meta-theatricality, really intimated to me her recognition of this construction of gender and culture that we impose on women. And her understanding of this social construction or artificiality that nonetheless carries really deep meaning was I found to be very poignant. Um, and I'll just end with one last comment, which was that 
at the exhibition, I stood over the small screen on the floor that showed the gorgeous bird's eye view of Toller's grandmother's farm. And when I did that, I saw the outline of my own shadow imprinted on the screen. So I felt that I too was aware that I was part of the community of people bearing witness to Toller's reenactment of her grandmother's work, of her own history, and the effect of these experiences on the creation of the migrant's identity. Um, it was almost as though the cinematic performance became an enactment of the performance of being. And as a result, identity was created anew. So I'll just leave it there for now. Okay, thank you for that, Natasha. And uh, wow, that was quite quite the entry point, um, quite the wonderful entry point to a really exciting exhibit and a really exciting experience. Um, so I come to uh, Laura Toller's exhibit, uh, both experientially and scholarly, right? Much, much like you, Natasha. Um, so I am an immigrant, I'm also a Jewish woman, um, and I live and work across mm -hmm. multiple languages. And so those different registers um, really resonated with me um, even before arriving to the exhibit. But what really enthralled me in the exhibit, what really drew me in the exhibit itself were, were, were both the experiential and the scholarly registers. And so in my work, I often focus on memory making and on diasporic and uh, immig immigrant experiences. And in my research, I often look at the tensions or the connections between diaspora and, indig and indigeneity. And I often think about it in the setting of the nation state and particularly in the context of settler colonial um, uh, nation state. But this was an opportunity to think about diaspora and immigration and identity and memory making outside that sometimes very limiting scope. And that was something that was very exciting to me as soon as I as I encountered the exhibit. And the, the other and perhaps more um, deeper register where, um, where I have an entry point to the exhibit is as an autobiography scholar. So I work with representations of lived experience. And I study both how they're made and so the making of representing our lives or our life stories, but also the way that our life stories are mediated and received. And so the responsibilities of audiences and how audiences are called to bear witness to life stories, to bear witness particularly to life stories about loss and atrocity and trauma. Um, and so to think about that dynamic of call and response that we have when we share our lived experiences, when we share our life stories. And in the exhibit, this dynamic of call and response and in Laura's work, what really drew me as an audience member was the many registers in which the exhibit really invites you in as a call and response, but also requires you to do work. Um, in, in the space, right? And so that you become part of the meaning making um, and the exhibit itself. And, and much like what you said, Natasha, you become a witness to Toller's work, but it's also an embodied experience. And so thinking about the affective registers, but also the material registers in which moving through the space in which the ability to see fragments or traces of, of each part of the work um, concur concurrently, but also to have to focus on them separately in order to kind of thread them together. And so to really think about the performativity and the dynamics of call and response in self-making and memory making. And so how does the experience of immigration, of being in diaspora, of memory making in diaspora, um, is really a work of self-making and is really both an embodied and a theoretical practice, which is always sort of 
entrenched in performativity in different ways. And I don't mean performativity as a critique. I, like I, I, I genuinely mean that it has different registers of performance in order to build that sense of self. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I feel uh, humbled <laughs> to go uh, and uh, offer my uh, reflections after such um, powerful uh, interventions that certainly have already given me so much to think about. Uh, but just sort of as a, as a way to introduce my entry point. Um, so both in my scholarly work and in my own life, um, I have been constantly trying to come to terms with what it means to be positioned and be from what was once called the second world or the socialist world uh, and the exact geographic contours of that very positionality are very blurred um, and itself as a, as a kind of a geographical cultural positionality it um, is very complicated but especially as it comes through as a form of um, backwardness vis-a-vis -vis the west and especially understood both uh, as Europe and and the great European culture to which it always stands as a kind of a, a supplement or as the other, uh, slightly backward. Uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis North American culture as well. And in my own work, I try to break out of ways of thinking uh, about this uh, duality vis-a-vis um, -vis the West and instead really think of how this uh, position of what was called a combined and un uneven development development really is also uh, iterated differently uh, geographically around the world and experientially as well, how it is experienced and specifically how to position it vis-a-vis -vis this uh, contemporary regime of migration, mobilities, transnational flow uh, in a way that actually disrupts the duality of the global north, the global south, or the east and the west, and just complicates our understanding, again, of, of very clearly drawn boundaries, both about our individual experiences as migrants from home and uh, where we landed, so to speak, but also these broader uh, geographic and geopolitical categories. And I'm actually happened to, uh, to be working right now on the way that Latin American music was um, um, the reception of Latin American music in Soviet and Eastern European culture in the 20th century as a way uh, to express a certain kind of political affects and intimacy. So, of course, I was very struck, uh, although not surprised by the use of both uh, tango and then uh, the Jewish song in this context, because um, one of the things that I'm also looking at is this kind of sometimes complicated and sometimes politically problematic and yet very evocative, often conflation between um, something like tango and some other forms of Latin American music and then Romani music specifically and Jewish music and the kind of entanglements of these as again, a, a way to express very complicated political and uh, intimate affects. And so I saw that so beautifully in uh, Laura Taller's uh, work. And in general, something that really struck me and something that really resonates with what I'm thinking about a lot uh, in Laura Taller's work is this um, dialectic, so the relationship between, on the one hand, the experience of dislocation, strangeness, foreignness, you know, decollage on the one hand, and then intimacy on the other, and how there are affordances uh, of both. And one of the things that I have noticed so much doing this scholarly historical work about different sites of encounters, you know, transnational encounters, either as travel or as uh, migration, or even as cinematic experiences uh, of watching foreign films at an international uh, film festival. So these forms of transculturation 
intuition, how very often the most intimate experiences tend to be afforded precisely by the sense of foreignness and dislocation. And so it's that relationship without nonetheless undermining the trauma of the dislocation and a certain sense of incommensurability between here and there. And that's something that I found in all three songs uh, captured so beautifully on many formal levels. Um, but it's also something that, again, I see as a very interesting aesthetic um, uh, set of um, relations, but also experientially, effectively, um, and uh, the kind of political effects that, um, that this creates. Um, and I was also really uh, struck by Abubakar Sanogo's, uh, in his discussion of it, how he put it, that Teller's concern with the great human journey of which migration and diaspora and exile are at once chapters and cornerstones. And I also was really thinking that all three works really capture this as well, how again, migration and dislocation is both a phase, a chapter, but also actually the cornerstone of our uh, human journey, as well as very politically, culturally situated moment in which we find ourselves in as individuals Individuals, again, for all those of us who have traveled, who have um, uh, relocated or been dislocated uh, and have reflected uh, on this process. So this has been a very, very, um, um, a very evocative, very exciting uh, journey through uh, Laura's work. So I thank uh, you for inviting me and I'm very much looking forward to exchanging our um, perspectives on it. Thank you so much for these incredibly rich uh, responses. And, you know, so much has already come up through this, this first question. Um, you know, thinking about the dialectics, as Masha was saying, of dislocation and intimacy, the entanglements and the incommensurabilities of, of these two states, um, you know, the value of women's work, as Natasha was talking about, and the emphasis on that uh, in uh, the song number two specifically. Um, and also the idea of, of Orly's contribution of, of memory making as self making um, and as witnessing and thinking about call and response. So, so much already here that we can continue to, to dig into and I think will be relevant to, to the second question that I have for all of you. Um, and so maybe I'll begin with what Orly said about how the exhibition makes you work <laughs> because it does. You're enthralled on the one hand and, and there is a certain labor involved, uh, multiple kinds of labor, but one specifically around the question of translation. So, you know, if I return back to the, the title of this panel, To Be Split in Two, this title is inspired by a sculpture made by Taller of her own head facing in two directions at once that appears in song three, which is an unmistakable reference, of course, to the Roman deity Janus. As a QAG curator, Heather Anderson, curator of this exhibition, puts it um, in her stunningly beautiful essay on the exhibition that you can all read in the exhibition guide. She writes, quote, Perpetually looking backward and forward, the Janus head expresses a feeling of doubling, of being split in two, that Toller describes as intrinsic to her experience as an immigrant, end quote. And you can see the, the image right here. So doubling and being split in two becomes a way of also thinking about the role that translation plays in this exhibition. And here I'm thinking of translation in broad terms, including linguistic translation, of course, but also other forms of translation, such as the gestural translation of words and everyday tasks. The Janus head replica made by Toller can itself be viewed as an aesthetic translation, uh, both of its maker and as an experience of, of dissonance. And while translation can be a bridge between and across worlds, this exhibition also draws our attention to the limitations of translation as a constitutive feature of the experience of migration. So uh, that's something of a preamble for my second question to our speakers. 
which is, uh, can each of you address the theme of translation, which runs through the exhibition in a myriad of ways? Uh, and maybe this time I will invite Masha to begin, uh, followed by Natasha and then Orly. Um, thank you so much to uh, to say about this and um, and translation, of course, is such a copious and and uh, um, inclusive category. And I was thinking that, of course, audiovisual time based media, of which uh, Laura Taller's work is is a beautiful example, uh, allows precisely for many forms of translation of meaning to be manifested from sound to image, oh. from language to gestural. Um, yeah. or vice versa, yeah. right, from one language to another, right, so all of the different, as well as in the case of a uh, multi-channel work uh, movement for translation of spaces, right, as well as, of course, it can be done on the level of, uh, you know, editing right and those kinds of uh, forms of translation so it is really there's so much to to reflect on here given the great primacy of the non-linguistic translation that is given in this work right which is of course underscored by the fact that we are not given the translation of the texts of the songs that are uh, are performed, um, therefore calling upon us as viewers to uh, interpret and translate these other non-linguistic elements with much greater attention. And this goes back to you know the 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 issue that has already come up um, that uh, as viewers we're really called upon to be hyper aware of the process of translation uh, and the kind of uh, labor that it entails and the absence uh, of it uh, as we again you know are confronted with our desire to understand and a kind of doubled effort to um, to try to translate the gestural um world and you know the 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 movements and um, one of the things that I was struck though by and you know things like the grain of the voice right which you know we don't think of you know we think of the voice as just a conduit of language but once we start thinking of translation as being non-linguistic but rather again gestural and almost uh, elemental in some ways um, it also um, you know brings so many additional ways of meaning transfer that again we as audiences are confronted with right and we start reading into uh, through this process. But what I was actually struck by here is um, in all three works is the kind of lack of interpersonal aspect of translation, because these are such lonely works right and of course that's something that really draws attention to the intimacy of both the experience um, and the kind of subjectivity in a way the irreducibly uh, lonely subjectivity of a um, you know uh, of you know you can say of a migrant and and you know someone who is going through this process of memory and grieving and you know uh, re-enacting traumatic uh, memories whether our own or or someone else's but I was really interested that the one moment in song number two where you see other people the artist is not there right so translation really here takes place between the artist the medium on, or the apparatus and the audience right and so this is another way as as already both um, the speakers articulated, we as audiences are very directly drawn into this process of, again, translation as part of a dialogue, as part of the conversation that we are being spoken to in the broader sense. And it's also, it, it that's why uh, the onus is in, in many ways on us to try to, um, to understand it, right? And so I actually think that part of the uh, this power of uh, the three songs is the singularity of Thaler's presence. And again, this kind of enigmatic foreignness that uh, um, where she's talking to us in a language that we have to decipher, whether it's the language again of gestures, of dance, of um, music, um, uh, or of her own personal memories to which of course we don't have access to, but we are constantly 
um, um, uh, translating. But again, the kind of singularity and, and in a way, reducibility of that kind of experience. And yet, I mean, I think this is where I would uh, argue that it may be points not so much to the limits of translation, but maybe just to the limits of the linguistic construction of meaning, right? And the kind of coexistence of, on the one hand, this irreducible subjectivity of uh, the artists and, and Laura Toller's experience, and yet, its ultimate translatability as, as we can all speak to, right? Like clearly so much comes across and resonates and translates in such complex ways, but in a way precisely because of the singularity of her presence, of her voice, of her tone, and very often precisely by the absence of translation given in the traditional sense of, um, you know, subtitles or, or voiceover, right? Just like our hyper awareness of that very process to me is not so much the limit, but rather in fact, enhancing the power of that notion uh, and how it functions in, in work. So I'll stop here, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Masha. I think uh, a lot of what you said resonates with um, how I might respond um, to this question as well. Um, so translation is, of course, a way of communicating meaning to someone who may not understand the original language if we're talking about linguistic translation. So for someone who wants to educate and communicate and get across ideas, translation is, of course, vital, um, yet impossible to perfect. Um, as Malini said, it helps to build bridges of understanding, um, and yet aspects, tendrils, remain unknowable, leaving those who require translation as outsiders in moments, and those who understand as insiders. And we each experience, I think, both of these vantage points at different times, and sometimes both at the same time. Um, and then, of course, depending on um, who the translator is, if we're, again, talking about linguistic translations, you can have different interpretations that emphasize or bring out different aspects of the original piece's tone or mood. Movement-based work is often much more abstract in that it requires, as Masha said, the observer to translate or be the interpreter to try to make sense of the meaning of a given gesture, say. Now, some gestures may have well-known meanings, uh, such as in certain dance vocabularies, or even more mundane gestures can be more conventionally understood in certain cultural contexts. But I think one of the most interesting things about art, and especially art of the interdisciplinary nature that Toller creates, is that it can have multiple meanings that allows the observer to go on a journey um, in either familiar or unknown territory. And so the untranslatability requires people to draw on their own experiences to make connections with the artist's proposals. Um, so for me in song number three, I felt that Toller's films really prodded us to recall that many migrations occur because there is a need to flee what we have known as home. And that migration is often not a choice, that it carries heavy memories of loss, of civil strife, of genocide. And many migrants will carry those stories of mourning with them. And they will be passed down to their children and to their children. And those stories will become part of their histories, used to understand perhaps parents' behaviors and attitudes. They become the context from which we then perceive life. And eventually they might be used in new stories and creations, including artistic ones, to elucidate and comprehend new experiences. So the cabaret style performance of Romania, Romania, and the worker in the plaster cast workshop carefully taking inventory are, I would say, new ways of translating histories of loss into the creation of new projects. So a song and a dance about Romania's glorious nostalgic past is performed 
yet it evokes a darkness and irony when it's juxtaposed with the broken busts and limbs in the factory. Um, there is a sense of another world, of time standing still, and indeed the clock has stopped, but then we're reminded of the ongoing ordinariness of daily life when she eats her lunch, washes her hands, goes to the car. Malini talked about the double-headed bust of Toller's likeness, which looks forward and back to the future and to the past, but it's ultimately put away, covered, but still visible under transparent plastic behind one of the screens. So how are we to interpret this? Well, I guess it depends on your perspective, on your history, on your state of mind that day. But I think this polysemy is what makes the work so rich, the ability to have multiple meanings, even if at times they might contradict. That's what I have found so interesting about, about this work. Thank you both. This is such a rich conversation. So thank you for all of this. Um, so to kind of add another register to thinking about translation. Um, yes, I was thinking about translation both in, in movement and in the language and, and thinking about translation both as a practice and as a theme in Toller's work, but mostly I was struck by the translation work that we need to do in experiencing the work. And so the movement in the space and how that creates the action uh, of translation, of, of working across medium or like um, translating between different mediums because we were working in the space with the visual, with the movement, with the audio. And so we're working on all these different registers and in order to engage with each of them, audiences need to move in the space. And one of the things that were really interesting when I was visiting the exhibit is that I was visiting it at a time when a classroom was visiting it. And so I could see the students' engagement and how students, and it wasn't my classroom. Um, mine are visiting next week, but uh, I, I got to see it as a bystander. And to see the students moving in the room and kind of having to navigate their place, even in order to be able to really focus on a screen and what is happening in the screen. And there's something really um, immersive with song number one, that you're standing at the corner of the gallery, it's darker, and you're immersed in this like huge screen and the audio of it. And that kind of keeps you going. And then at some point, some students noticed that the text is actually translated. The song is actually translated on a side screen in English and French in a text that kind of moves. And so they kept reading and going back to the main screen and reading and going back to the main screen and standing in line to read the words because they wanted to know the text. And then as we moved into song two, and all of a sudden you're working with multiple screens across different angles of the room and with multiple sort of points that demand your attention. You want to see what Laura is doing on one screen. You want to see the aerial view of the farm on another screen. And so having to move across those different spaces of the gallery and then that are they're kind of encapsulated right each song is in its own space and you move between the three and you do need also the guide the the you do need Fiona in the room to guide you between the songs for the audio to actually work right and so you also need that extra layer of mediation and so I was thinking about the way that translation in experiencing the work um, actually sort of puts you in a position where you experience it in fragmented ways that you're like experiencing traces of the work at any given time and then you need to do a lot of the meaning making work but you're working constantly on those multiple registers. And so 
you are experiencing um, being in translation in that moment. And you're experiencing Laura Toller in translation in that moment. And so the sense of the exhibit as an embodied experience receives that, that whole level, um, that whole level of, of meaning. But as you get to song number three, and that's where something really interesting happened to me as, as an audience member, as, as, a, as, a, as a viewer of the exhibit. Um, there's a play around accessibility and inaccessibility. And, and both of you, um, Natasha and Masha, have spoken to the sense of translation, both delineating possibilities and, and, and bridges and ways to know, but also demarcating borders of things that you cannot know because you don't have access to them or things that I don't want you to know. And with song number three, when you're, um, when you're in that space and you're looking at the two events concurrently, they're on like one screen that is, that is uh, two screens that are next to one another. And you're, you're looking at both of them and the juxtaposition between the two is all of a sudden so stark, the juxtaposition between the casting um, workshop and then of the cabaret, the performance of the cabaret in the silent theater and knowing that both of them are in Berlin and, and that sense of not, that sense of memory making where you know that the trauma is looming, where the trauma is in the background, but the trauma isn't what is represented on the screen. It is just suggested. And so representing the loss, representing the death, representing the mass destruction without actually showing any of the violence, without actually showing any of the atrocity, but just the sense of it is carried in the embodied knowledge, in the cultural knowledge. Um, and so that was a moment where my access was all of a sudden a little bit different. And so in that moment, seeing, um, Natasha, you were talking about the daily actions, the daily actions of washing the hands and opening the meal and eating the lunch. I read it entirely differently. I read it as a ritual of mourning because in Jewish tradition, a major part of our mourning ritual has to do with visiting our dead, but before leaving the cemetery, washing our hands and then sharing a meal together. And the sharing of the meal together is actually quite ritualistic also in what we include in that meal. And so I come from, my, my father is an Iranian Jew, my mother is a Bulgarian Jew. And so for example, in Bulgarian Jewish tradition, that meal of, of mourning, that meal that we share is always, you have a hard boiled egg, you have a burekas, and you have um, either a cucumber or a cornichon or something like that. And like, that would be the meal which the components of it are an essential part of the ritual. And you were drink rakia with it. Um, and so you have like a, a bit of a, of a shot to say for good health and good life. But for me, that was a moment of a ritual of mourning. It wasn't an every day. And it struck me that I was the only person in the room who read it that way because the students kept talking about how much it's an everyday ritual and how much it was a beautiful part of that. Again, entering women's work and entering artists' work as well and how artists work, we all often think about it as so elevated, but it also has these very daily um, aspects. And so, that was a moment where working in translation and thinking about access and inaccessibility and being in translation as audience members was, was really, really interesting and really, um, really intriguing, I think. Um, because one of the things that when I 
read about the exhibit and when I saw a few of the images before actually visiting the exhibit, I was wondering if that sense of close intimacy might position us as voyeurs in the room. And so, and so the risk of actually it being in translation, positioning other people as voyeurs and that not happening. And that was a really like, for me, that was a, such a beautiful moment and such a, such a like reveling moment in, in, in experiencing the exhibit, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, let me ask if anybody would like to respond to each other at this point. Um, such rich, wonderful responses. Yeah, I just wanted to see if anybody, if any of you wanted to respond to each other at this point. I mean, I would just comment that um, I, I really appreciated, Orly, what you said about um, the way that we experience this work is is necessarily different, you know, based on our own experiences. And, um, you know, it's sort of uh, like when you read a Salman Rushdie novel and he uses a Hindi or Urdu word and he doesn't bother to translate it and there's no glossary. Um, and you can probably figure out generally what he's getting at because of the context of the sentence, but that insider has the ability to kind of really get at um, one meaning. I don't even know if it's the real meaning, but it's one meaning that's a really important one. Um, and so I think that's exactly right. That's probably what happened in terms of me being an outsider in that moment and you being an insider. And, and that's, um, at, at, for me, that's a very interesting and very rich way in which to view art and, and, and view translation even. Yeah, and I think that that is what's really interesting and intriguing and, and, and also engaging in the exhibit, right? So that you have so many points of entry and departure and you have so many registers of thinking. And, and it's interesting that you brought the Salman Rushdie uh, example because as I was thinking about the, the translation question, I kept thinking about... Um, there's this essay that he wrote, I think like back in 1990, about um, being a writer who works, like being an immigrant writer. So, so writing, thinking across languages, across translation. And he talked about the fact that the moment you leave home, you see everything with this multiple perspective. You, you no longer, and, and he actually talks about it as like putting on glasses with multiple um, with multiple lenses and you can no longer almost like a kaleidoscope situation right where you're going to see always the multiplicities you're going to see the different colors the different levels but you're also going to see how they each have their own shape and how they can come together and so you constantly read or you constantly speak on multiple registers at the same time and to me that was like the aha moment a little bit in the in the exhibit right and I think that's what just happened in both of our interpretations. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for these responses and for getting us to see how translation is, becomes this, this rich site of so many possibilities. But as, as you were saying, Orly, also about borders and accessibility. And I really appreciated that uh, you sharing your experience of the third song, because I feel like I had... Um, I saw it initially as an everyday, right? An everyday situation until, you know, the translation comes at the end. And I was, oh, right, that's what I missed, that this is actually a, a morning ritual. But I like that these, these experiences that are held in tandem, right? They're, they're both part of my experience of this, of this work. Uh, and I really like the way the exhibition does that. But if I could chime in, I mean, I think my sense was also I felt like I was even even if I hadn't recognized the um, the, um, you know, <laughs> um, morning connotations of of the ritual of, of eating, there was this kind of cluing in uh, because to me the the setting of these, um, you know, busts and and uh, basically did look in a very maybe symbolically um, uh, 
obvious and yet in their particularity transcending just the sheer symbolism of it is these kinds of these are the ruins of the western uh, civilization as we know it which you know of course we do think of the holocaust as one of those moments that brought precisely to light the barbarism uh behind uh the uh you know sort of <laughs> the the great western culture of which you know these are such embodiments of right but also like their maidness as you know as she is actually is engaged in you know working with plaster but because it also resonated with the previous piece with song number two where we have a similar process of mourning that and this is where like I'm almost like connecting Natasha and Orly's reading of it right because I do think that it's very much both it's about the quotidian and by necessity um, again quotidian almost pedestrian everyday nature of our mourning rituals and how they become so intertwined with forms of labor and forms of domestic performances, but also, um, uh, again, rituals and re-experiencing of those traumas. And what I was also thinking that another form of translation there to me was also this kind of cultural translation where the trauma doesn't even always have to be your own, right? I mean, the trauma gets communicated and translated in these uh, cultural ways, the same way as, um, um, you know, you become aware of at once the singularity of that historical experience, but also the degree to which it speaks to so many other historical traumas of annihilation. And again, the the kind of the barbarism of, of um, you know, <laughs> I apologize for what sounds like a cliche, but of like, again, Western civilization and, you know, uh, colonialism and, and forms of, you know, modernity, right? That I think, you know, the memory memory is at once your own personal memory. It's a bodily memory that is reenacted through these everyday gestures because you've done it so many times, you've mourned so many, but it's also, it contains memories that are both your own people's, but so many other people's as well as they get translated and become recognizable, right? And again, it's it's that interests me as well, how it is both your own, your family, your people's, and yet we can so, you know, it translates, like you recognize the language, again, even through the language of dance, you know, you know that this is Weimar Republic, and you recognize in the musical tonality, even if you didn't know that this was a Jewish song, you would recognize them. And somehow that kind of transcultural memory still is present, even in those like daily gestures and forms of labor still, because again, even as you know, again, in those forms of mourning, this is a form of labor that is primarily, uh, you know, prof you know, <laughs> done by women and the responsibility as what Natasha started her uh, first intervention with is, is carried through and the kind of the burden in a way of, of reproducing that um, is so there and it, precisely in its seeming kind of you know, again, quotidian, um, uh, very uh, every day, like lack of dramatization, right? And as as um, Orly, you were also saying, lack of this, the visualization or even hints, you know, of of the, the magnitude of the drama, right? Like there's something about that exact, um, um, not just juxtaposition, but like fusion of these things, right? That I think makes it so particularly evocative and, and, and it works so beautifully well on both of these levels, right? Whether you are cued into every single cultural connotation of it or not, it's there's something very recognizable about it. And I think the exhibition, uh, to use Masha's words, makes you hyper aware of that process, right? That it makes you hyper aware that you can understand things even when they're not a direct linguistic or clear or explicit translation. The exhibition gets you to see that, which I think is quite brilliant. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, maybe we should just move to my final question. I think a lot of what we've been saying feeds into this last question, too. So, uh, I'm going to quote my film studies colleague now, Abu Bakar Sanogo, who also wrote one of the, the beautiful essays for this exhibition that you can read in the exhibition guide. 
And uh, he says, quote, the work of Laura Toller may be best understood as an art of movement, movement in its multitude of forms. And as Sunogo writes, these movements between the past and the present and across multiple ways of understanding home and the possibilities of language foreground tensions or various forms of dissonance that unfold in different ways across this video, across all of these works as we've been discussing uh, through the language of translation. And so some of these tensions are encapsulated in my third question for our speakers. So I begin this question with a, a quote from the audience, uh, sorry, from Laura Toller, the artist. So I'll just read that out. Uh, Toller says, quote, is it possible to make a home in a new land and let go of what you left behind? How can you learn a new language while holding on to your past? And so my question for, for our speakers is, can each of you comment on these questions raised by the artist, which speak directly to uh, Toller's engagement with the questions of movement, migration, and dispersal in this exhibition, both on screen, but also in the presentation of the moving image works in the gallery, uh, which Orly has, has touched upon already, but we can we can talk about this more now. Uh, Orly, would you like to to begin, and then uh, Masha, and then we can we can round off with Natasha. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, thank you for these really wonderful questions, Melanie. Uh, they're so rich, and I think the conversation is really showing that as well. So. As I was thinking about this question and, and particularly Laura Toller's quote that you kind of build on, I don't know that we need to let go of what is left behind. And I don't think that holding on to the past prevents from learning a new language or making a new home. And I don't think that the exhibit asks for that or requires that because I think that's actually where the richness is. Um, First, in the recognition that the knowledge is very much in the body, in the bones. And so, so that like the cultural knowledge, the, 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 the what is of the homes that you have, whether it's the original one you left or any homes along the way, that those are in the bones. So like the, the, the intergenerational knowledge, whether it is trauma or whether it is tradition or whether it is women's work in quotidian actions they're in the bones they're in the body they're embodied in a lot of ways and i that was one of the very interesting things about song two where these different performances of the self you don't them on and you take them off but you stay with them constantly whether whether the wig is there or not the knowledge of it in your body is still there and so one of the things that I was that I was thinking about this question of, of making a new or, or with leaving behind is that the exhibit positions or, or suggests migration and, and, uh, and diaspora as, as an experience of concurrent multiplicities, right? As, as a formation and, and performance of, of multiple selves that are enmeshed together that are that are living concurrently in this body together. And so that you reside in these both remainders of a past and emergences of presence or futures, and that you have both the echoes or traces of memory or fragments of language or glimpses of the past, but at the same time, those of a future. And so that home actually becomes a verb. And so it's like the sense of an act of homing, right? And that it is certainly grounded in or in relation to place. So like the idea is how much attention is given to sound and light and land and movement and touch and language, um, um, verbal language. So all of those are represented as, as in action, in doing. And so home isn't at any point in the exhibit a single place that you're in or that you're, you leave or that you can return to or can't return to because there's um, in, in Abu Bakr Sanagu Sango, sorry, 
um, essay, this beautiful essay, they're also referencing Deleuze, right? And, and the idea of repetition with a difference. And I kept thinking about how much it's returns with a difference in the exhibit. So yes, there's the repetition, but it's also the return to or return from. And there's this sense of, of going back and going forward that the repetition offers a return that we often don't talk about when we think about immigration. We often think about immigration as A to B, potentially to C, if you really have to. But um, we don't often talk about B to A or to even what was a precursor to A, right? And so in that sense, that is where for me, the richness of the exhibit lies. That is where for me, the richness of ideas of home and, and, and immigration. And, and that is, it's, it's actually interesting because when I started to think about, um, Laura Toller also has this moment where, um, in a different work or in a different essay uh, in, in, the, in the exhibit guide, she asks how one gives oneself permission to embody that which is foreign. And at first, when I read the, that question, I was like, uh, this could go in a lot of different ways and not all of them are good. Um, and, so, and, and some of them are, are very tricky and, and, and layered and, and potentially dangerous especially when we think about experiences of minoritized communities and of communities who, who have been and are oppressed. And so, but when you go through the exhibit and when you experience the exhibit, you're like, oh, actually, there's a careful engagement with that question that is very much about not risking a universality, but staying enough with the locality that it's actually really still grounded, but the shared questions can be asked. And that is a very difficult balance to strike. And that is a very difficult question to engage with um, in such a nuanced and, and, and rich way. And so I, I'm really thankful for, for three songs that, that it offers that experience. And like, final note, as a scholar who often works in the context of a nation state or, or in, in thinking about migration and diaspora and indigeneity in relation to nation states, having an opportunity to think about migration in a way that yes, Romania is very present throughout, right? But it isn't about leaving Romania or being Romanian or being an immigrant from Romania to Canada. And so being able to, because we often think about movement from state borders X into state borders Y um, and from culture X to culture Y, right? And being able to dissociate from that through the work of translation in all of its different registers, that was a really, really rich, um, part of, of the exhibit. So no, I don't think we need to leave things back in order to make a new. And I think, yeah, the, the exhibit really shows the richness of not having to do that. Is it my turn? <laughs> Thank you. I'm still thinking of it very much what um, Orly just said um, resonates with my own take on it, because I'm actually, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in the more complex ways of thinking of, again, embodying foreignness as almost part of this, you know, condition, right, you know, and, and how do you negotiate uh, movement across borders, across cultures, in a way that doesn't fall necessarily with a lot of attention to precisely, as you were saying, the pitfalls and some very, very very problematic political um, uh, conditions and cult whole cultures that it can create. And yet, you know, 
<laughs> you kind of inevitably sooner or later speak others languages and embody certain foreignness when you do uh even when you don't travel as as i was saying you know as through these various processes of of um transculturation and how do you disentangle the power relations that come with this process um in a way that is um, uh, I don't know, politically responsible and sensitive, but also remains true to the actual experience that can be incredibly powerful. I think um, this work just captures uh, for me in a way that is, uh, yeah, was almost same, you know, almost unexpected, but I was precisely thinking of how, you know, like, well, of course, you know, being Romanian or being whatever you come from is never that simple thing that is one nation state. You know, you don't know that complexity of, of uh, uh, exactly where you come from and, uh, you know, where you land is also very often a, a transitory state and people do come back and then leave again and uh, and it captures it very well. But one specific thing in that relation that I was really struck by is how maybe, again, being a diasporic subject or maybe just a, a subject who lives in the state of duality that, uh, you know, is captured by the figure of the Janus, Again, one of the affordances that it offers is, for example, you can come back to certain things that you have become aware of as tropes and stereotypes and associations that are very problematic. For example, the association of femininity with nature. Right. And sort of the figure of a woman in the forest. Right. As well as, again, very specifically, as you um become as you come from um again you know this would be <laughs> much of the world outside of let's say western europe and north america uh there is this the, the associations between where you come from with backwardness which also means rural life you know these associations then with also domesticity and again the all of these different re, different forms that as a woman you know there is association with domesticity that can often be very reactionary, right? Uh, and that is projected onto you necessarily, right? You know, as, as you say, as a woman immigrant from whatever second, third world, you know, you are constantly experiencing these projections of these sets of associations, right? As well as I would say, as a woman artist, you know, they're almost, you know, at a certain points, almost, you, know, you cannot possibly do work that would be associated with certain, let's say, romantic notions of femininity, etc. And yet it's precisely from the position of this dislocation that you can come back and you can own it and you can repossess it uh, in a way that becomes both an act of defiance as well as an act of actually coming back, let's say, to embody your past and uh, the memory and its meaning, right? But it's only possible through this double movement of displacement and the return, right? And having been the object onto whom these associations have been continuously projected and expectations and, you know, notions. And again, coming back on the other side and actually owning some of what is meaningful for you to embody as a way, again, of, of reconnecting and making, um, you know, meaning of those, um, of those associations, right? Like grandmother's home, women's work, you know, uh, all of those and, you know, nature as well. <laughs> Right, all of these things that I also thought that is um, is incredibly effective as again, but but in itself predicated on that split that would have been unimaginable without it, right? And again, to to take it back to um, Alini's sort of second half of the question, I think is very much enhanced by our position as spectators in the gallery space, where again. Um, your own bodily positioning as Orly described in such beautiful detail, right? Like your own bodily positioning is so present, right? You yourself are so aware of where you are, right? And that movement from the more immersive experience to suddenly having to negotiate your limbs, right? And, you know, are you blocking the entrance or, you know, those kinds of questions all the way to casting shadows onto some of the images, right? So your own embodied presence, I think, enhances that sense. Um, 
of, again, on the one hand, dislocation, but on the other hand, again, what it enables and what it uh, affords and kind of owning certain things and connect, reconnecting to them through those, uh, those very dislocations and, uh, and movements. Thank you. Um, I, my thoughts on this question, I think, resonate um, with the, some of the themes that both Orly and, and Masha have noted, in particular, this idea of concurrent multiplicities and um, displacement and negotiating, you know, what home is. Um, but I, I think what, the way I'll address this is a little more pedestrian and, and maybe also personal. Um, I think first, though, I'd note that the migrant experience is going to be very different for different migrants. Um, the experience of migration is going to differ substantially. If one comes to a new country as a child, an adult, a refugee, if one is recognized as a citizen in the country of arrival, um, if the migration occurred before the expansion of fairly inexpensive communication technologies, or if one is leaving a place where one was a member of the majority or a minority community. I think each of these particularities will color one's migration experience. So my own experience of migration as a child of parents who were quite secure in their cultural and religious identities and really had no reason to hide it from me as we know sometimes occurs in some persecuted communities um, was that of being raised in a modest but secure home that was actually quite rich in culture. So we spoke Urdu and Bengali at home, and I learned English and French at school, and I studied a classical Indian dance form in Toronto. And I knew that this form of dance was marginalized in mainstream arts venues, but I nonetheless had the experience of studying it with a gifted teacher that probably wasn't much different from what my friends in India were doing. So while my parents certainly had a sense of loss, of something being left behind, my own experience was of having access to a rich variety of cultural practices thanks to a very vibrant diaspora community that my parents had a hand in creating. So yes, some might say my culture has been diluted somewhat, um, for example, in my mastery of a language, but I felt it was also significantly enhanced or enriched by the hybridity with which I viewed my identity and my experiences. So Toller's song number one really reminded me of the nostalgic, but perhaps false idea that many older immigrants hold of back home, being a place of authenticity, of being a place from their memory that remains static. So if I were to give you an example, my father really wanted me to study at his university in India so that I could learn um, the Urdu poets that he is so fond of and who so profoundly influenced him. So he had a very particular idea about what this experience would be for me. So when I was 18, I spent a year studying at Aligarh Muslim University in near Delhi. And while I did experience the mushairas or the gatherings in which poets recite their work, it was not a place that most of my Indian peers frequented because they were too busy listening to Madonna and Michael Jackson. So we sometimes forget that culture is never static, that what we remember is the past, not what now exists there. So I found Laura Toller's placement of song number one among the trees as very noteworthy, because to me, she complicates this notion of going back home. While a forest certainly grows, or it can be dramatically cut down, where the latter hasn't happened, the forest's changes are often less perceptible than in, say, urban environments. So the song, This Is How I'd Like to Die, is a memory of home, but it can't remain static. We may have a longing for home, but it can't be the same home of our past. So singing this old song among the trees, rather than in a bar, changes the use and the meaning of the song. You might describe this as a loss, 
but it's also a new configuration of the song's words and, and therefore its meaning. Um, <clears throat> the song might be, the song sung in the forest in the way that it is, might be an acknowledgement of um, maybe a subtle declaration of climate change. I think Laura's averting eyes can suggest a kind of self-consciousness with her new creation that may or may not be well received. Um, but then the snapping of the fingers, I felt really created a dialogue with um, the surrounding environment. So the reimagining of the song of home, I think this becomes a very necessary part of a migrant's journey. Thank you so much for all of these wonderful uh, responses. And I like, you know, I like the range of responses here. And I, I like Natasha that, you know, you're returning to your own history and your own past and in, in, in addressing this question. I, I really like that a lot. And it resonates uh, a lot with me <laughs> in my own experiences of, of growing up in a, in a Bengali diaspora here. But I, uh, yeah, I love the way you've answered this question, all three of you, uh, and beginning with Orly, right, that actually you don't have to let go of home. <laughs> That's a false premise. You don't have to do that at all. But um, I like the way we've talked about this in terms of repetition and return and the complexities of, of what that is and what it enables, as Masha was, was talking about, that it enables a form of of reclamation and of ownership of the things that we actually want to hang on to. Um, and I really like the way, uh, Natasha, you were talking about song number one in terms of the, the new configurations. That's really striking to me across all of these songs, actually, that when you put these songs in a different context, that it's, yeah, there's the feeling of dissonance, but there's also the feeling of something else is happening here, something new is happening here, uh, which I really appreciate and like. Um, yeah, so let me ask, it would... Would any of you like to respond to, to each other at this point? Any thoughts that were arising as you were listening to each other speak? And while I get you to think about that, uh, audience, <laughs> do you have any questions for us? Uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We, we definitely have time to, to address questions from, from the audience. Um, this is a 90 minute event. So we've got we've got a good 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, any thoughts at all, uh, please put them in the chat. They don't need to be fully formed. Uh, you know, if there's anything you just want to discuss with us, please feel free. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about too was um, when Orly was talking about, you know, Romania is, is everywhere in this exhibition, but it is not about being Romanian. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. It's not about that particular question. Um, and I like, um, yeah, I was thinking about music, how music just contributes to that feeling, right? That because you're using music as, as a way of representing or a way of thinking about place, that automatically, you know, that's not the music and national identity can go hand in hand, but they certainly don't have to. And in this case, I think they really don't. Um, I'm going to read out what Fiona uh, wrote in the chat here. Uh, students are always struck by that moment in song two when Laura removes her wig and comes uh, at it in different ways. Uh, either a moment of traveling back uh, to the current moment, an acknowledgement of the failure to return, a wink to us in the audience, uh, or a moment of liberation and relaxation of being herself. How do you interpret it? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, Fiona. I might go at this first if uh, um, for me, it was actually a really interesting moment because as someone who thinks about the performativity of life stories and how we always perform our, our personal experiences and our personal stories in certain ways, it was such a beautiful moment of, of being like, yeah, she did. She did don't uh, uh, like a, a wig and, and took it off and, and, and speaks very directly to that, right? To how um, identity and more than identity, authenticity, our ideas about authenticity 
authenticity is a performance. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have or a, a real core, but it is a fashioning of, um, of a particular truth, of a particular sense of self. And so for me, it was such a beautiful moment where I was like, yeah, she did. Um, because everything else felt about, about the outfit was clearly of a different time, of a different place, right? So for all of us, that's a, that's a cue that all of the audience reads very quickly, but the, the headpiece, the wig, that was the one thing that we were all like, hmm, what's going on? And then when she took that off, it was a really beautiful moment, yeah. Thank you, Orly. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Well, uh, Natasha or Masha, would you like to? Sure. I, I've sort of alluded a little bit to what I thought um, the uh, removal of the wig uh, meant to me. I, I love the question because I think it it sort of gets at um, what we've all been talking about that, you know, we can take so many different meanings from, um, you know, a single gesture. Uh, for me, as I sort of alluded it was really the theater, the cinema being aware of itself, you know, that that came across. But I also felt that it really represented um, how much our understanding of what is knowable is socially constructed, you know, so our understanding. And I think in, in my example, I used it in the context of um, constructions of gender, constructions of uh, women's work, you know, that we have ideas about uh, what those things are, but that they're they're naturalized, whatever that means. Um, but that really we we construct those socially. And for me, that's what the the wig really, the removal of the wig really represented. And I feel so now thrown off by, I mean, in, in a good way, by the multiplicity of these meanings, even some of the ones that Fiona suggested, for example, this moment of liberation and relaxation, I actually looking back at it, I thought, oh, that was there too. Like there was something and I, and I wonder, you know, I'm tempted to link it to both the kind of, both the necessity and um, its own authenticity of these performances, but also some moment of of relief when it's over and when you can put it aside, as well as maybe a certain moment of resignation as well behind it, right? And it's so subtle. Um, but again, all of these things, right? The social constructedness, the performativity of the gesture, but also a play on expectations as again, like, you know, you cannot help uh, assuming, right? Of what these kinds of, you know, memories, identities, pasts mean, right? And then, you you know, setting it aside, there's definitely something, I mean, cathartic is too strong a word for such a subtle gesture. And yet there's definitely, it's true, I think for a lot of us and clearly from Fiona's comment for many audiences, there's something that really happens at that moment that definitely combines all of these things that we have suggested, right? So now I'm also like, I'm having a hard time even remembering what was my initial, <laughs> my initial reading of it. Um, Thank you, Masha. Yeah, me too, actually. That 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 question is getting me to to wonder about what I thought it meant uh, and how many how many things it could have actually meant. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you, Fiona. I think we have another question here. Um, I'll read it out. During the images that recalled morning, did anyone see a relation between the sculpture and the creation of a death mask? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, did any of you, was that an association that any of you had made while you were watching song number three? You know, it wasn't an association that, that I made um, per se, but now I sort of think about, um, you know, and I, I sort of posed this rhetorically um, in, as I was as I was sort of in one of my interventions is, you know, why was the sculpture, um, this double headed sculpture placed at the back of the screen covered, um, but still visible? Um, you know, is that a sort of 
this is too dangerous, this is too risky um, for us to kind of have out in the open. So it reminds me of some of those kind of themes um, around uh, death and maybe a death mask, but it's not something that I thought um, initially. For me, it was um, it was really a new creation. It was um, something that um, Laura's um, character was kind of engaging in. Um, and was kind of playing with this theme of duality or hybridity. Um, yeah, I think that's my sort of incoherent response <laughs> at this point. Not remotely incoherent, uh, very coherent. <laughs> uh, Masha or Lee, would you like to respond? I mean, mine is, is really on the level of associations that I'm not even claiming any validity to, but to me, you know, the, the actual, the work of the plaster is so connected to precisely these kinds of busts that are part of, uh, you know, the economy of, uh, of commemoration. And, uh, uh, and there's both um, the kind of, again, the sort of the labor and the industrial, even though it is artisanal, of course, but not nonetheless like the kind of the again the sort of the the whole industry that comes with it right so to me it was uh, the association wasn't so much with the kind of a sacred uh, connotations of a death mask but almost the opposite of kind of mundane production of constant recreations of cultural symbols and uh you know the the dead ones right you know as in the cemeteries etc but again this is just on the level of kind of free associations which I mean of course work that is so polysemic and so open invites right and and kind of provokes in a way exactly yeah yeah that's super interesting because like I for me again that that moment those images were very much through my cultural knowledge right and so at first I was like oh okay so this is in Berlin and she's in this space with, yes, parts of bodies like busts that are broken and things like that, but also a place that very visibly was really masculine in some ways. Uh, most of the busts, most of the head figures were of men. Um, and in a space where you don't often see Jewish representation. And she puts, this Jewish woman on, on the shelf along with all the other busts. So that was a moment of like seeing what, like seeing yourself or making yourself into that image, into that space, putting yourself, inserting yourself onto that shelf. For me, that was a really moment not of mourning or loss, but rather of asserting presence asserting I'm still here I'm very much taking up space here and at the same time when I was thinking about the practices of mourning it felt so foreign because in many um, Jewish cultures we actually cover mirrors during the time of mourning we don't um, put front and center images um, of our dead while we're mourning them. Um, we do not display the figure uh, of the dead during the ceremonies of mourning them. And so that part is very private. So the privacy of the person who passed and their image after passing is, um, is not on display. Um, we do at different times and different cultures within Jewish traditions have a different way of doing it. But generally speaking, even our um, tombstones don't carry uh, the facial representation uh, of our dead. And I do know that that, again, that shifts between different different communities in, in Jewish tradition, but traditionally we don't. And so for me, that was a moment where thinking about it in juxtaposition with, um, with the morning rituals in that same video were really interesting, but at the same time also seeing the cabaret image on the other screen and the cabaret performance on the other screen and that performance and that outfit and that um, 
even, you know, the hairdo and the makeup and that entire physical performance, for me, that was more of a mask than actually um, the bust itself. Um, so that was that was really interesting, like that juxtaposition. So thank you for that question, Margaret. It's it's a really interesting one. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Margaret. I mean, look at all these brilliant responses that were generated and that really, um, you know, get to the heart of, of what's been discussed here. So um, I think this is a good way to end things, end this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers so very much for, for sharing your, your brilliant contributions and your experiences of this exhibition with all of us. Uh, thank you to the audience for, for being here. Uh, Fiona, maybe I'll let you do the official closing. Well, sure. sure, yeah, just thank you, uh, all four of you. What an incredible discussion. Just the depth of, uh, of your engagement with it and, and really being able to speak to each other's um, perspectives. Was, it was just a joy to listen to. I'm so, so, so happy. Um, so thank you so much I've, um, to our audience. I've put um, information about the exhibition in the chat. Um, so um, uh, please come and visit uh, the exhibition if uh, you haven't already. But otherwise, I hope everyone has a really lovely um, Wednesday evening. Bye, everyone. <laughs>